breakthrough in an end time prophetic move. Now, I don't know where you stand on end time prophecy, but you know Jesus is coming back. Amen? Do you know why he's coming back and when he's coming back? Well, when you read your Bibles and you see in Matthew 23, 37 through 39, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and rejected the one sent to you. Like a mother hen longs to gather her chicks, how I long to gather you back to me, but you were not willing. O Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the Jewish people have to come to faith. Something has to happen to bring the Word of God to our Jewish people that they might usher in the return of Messiah. And this is a part of this work. You see, you're making a difference tonight. When you read in your Bibles that Jew and Gentile become one in Messiah, that's exactly what's happening tonight because we are all one in Messiah, man. I've got to tell you the truth because it says the Word of God, the truth will set you free. Amen? How many of you know that your victory is because of the shed blood of Messiah? How many of you know that you bear the mark of the Messiah and the enemy looks at you and he cannot have you? You are redeemed, you are sealed by the blood of the Lamb. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. It was not access to the kingdom of heaven for the Jew. It was not access for the kingdom of heaven. For the Gentile, it was access for the kingdom of heaven for all to receive the Lamb of God. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we bend the knee of our heart to you, Father God. We're in such awe of this week, Lord God, where we celebrate the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Messiah. And Father, I ask that you would just give us a heart to receive what you would have for us tonight as we study the last days of Jesus' life. And so, Lord, move by your Spirit. Reveal things to us, wonderful, marvelous, supernatural things that uh, change us. Not just inform us, but transform us, Father, as we dedicate this time to you and give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we talked about the laying out of the uh, uh, the conversations about the Last Supper that Numbers chapter 2 and verse 29. The layout of the tabernacle had 12 tribes. The leaders of the tribes each had individual names. Their names were prophetic. The twelfth leader was named Ahira ben Enon, Ahira son of Enon, which translates my brother is evil. And so when we look at the Last Supper and we see the twelfth one at the table was who? Lazarus. I'm sorry, uh, Judas. Judas Iscariot. So the brother of evil. So when we look at this, we see that God is foretelling that. The 23rd Psalm, the same thing. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We talked about the washing of feet and the real meaning behind it, the understanding, the deeper understanding of not just an act of humility, but truly the disciples wanting not to have the teachings of Jesus washed from them. And his message to them is, I'm not taking it from you, it should be not on you, but in you, as you remember the blessing that the old traditional blessing of, of uh, the rabbis that may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi, meaning his teaching. And so when he was washing their feet, he was truly washing the dust from their feet, referencing their teaching, his teaching. And so it had to, he wanted to impress upon them that it would be inside of them, not just upon them. I challenged you about communion being established. And remember, under the Old Testament, you have Leviticus 17.11 all the way through 17.14 that clearly states, clearly states that the life of a thing is in the blood and the blood for making atonement, that no one is to consume it or you'll be cut off from the house of Israel. So if this is the case, how did 12 men, 12 Jewish men sitting around the table with a rabbi 
consume his body and blood. Well, you say it's literal, it's figurative, it's symbolic, but the scripture says have nothing to do with the blood. Even Acts chapter 15 says have nothing to do with the blood. Abstain from the blood, meaning nothing to do with it. So what was it that he was revealing? What could he have been disclosing to them? What was it that they understood? Because in Matthew 5, 17, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. And not until everything that must happen has happened. And so we know that the end of the law of Moses was when Jesus breathed his last and said it is finished. So in order for them to be in obedience to the law, how could they possibly violate the command of Leviticus 17, 11 through 14? It's a challenge, isn't it? It's puzzling. What could have possibly occurred? What could they have understood? So if you didn't come to this Palm Sunday service, I encourage you to come on Friday night where I will preach with a live lamb. And no animals will be harmed in the presentation of this sermon. No, Audrey, I'm not going to slit its throat. <clears throat> but thanks for asking. You know, when we read about the Last Supper, as Jesus is preparing, he says, go to the man carrying water. Men don't carry water. Remember, 2,000 years ago, men didn't carry water. We know several times Jesus was at the well. We know the story of, of uh, Abraham sending out his servant to go find a suitable wife. He sent his oldest servant to go, and he went and waited by the well. Why? Because that's where the women gathered. So who could he have been talking to as he was telling them to go to a man carrying water? And it was the Essenes. The Essenes were a sect of Judaism that were the super spiritual. We tend to think of the Essenes being the, the, uh, the dancing, the joyous, the, jubilee, the, the, the ones who were full of jubilation, that they were out by the Dead Sea. They're the ones that hung out at Qumran. So that was their area, and they were men. No women were in their group. And we tend to think that the rabbis of the Hasidim who come from Russia, that you see the dancing rabbis. You can look online and see great dancing events of the rabbis as we come unto Passover. And you see the dancing rabbis are dancing all over the place, and it's, it's wonderful, and they're filled with joy. And they're very spirit-filled. Not spirit-filled of the Messiah, but spirit-filled of God. They're the ones that are much more open to discussions about spiritual matters. We know that uh, it's believed that John spent two years with the Essenes. That's why he was there in the region. We know that that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were transcribed and they were placed into the jars that we will go visit there when we're in Israel. And we'll see the Dead Sea Scrolls. He talked about the one who dipped with him. Now, when we had communion here, you took the bread and you dipped it in the wine, but that's not what he was talking about. The whole ceremony of Passover is about the bitter herbs and about the hardship of being in Israel. So this was a celebration. The Last Supper was a Passover Seder. And what's interesting is the wording is how long I have longed, how, how, how long I have wanted to celebrate this Passover with you. Not the Passover. Is that important? This or the? It certainly is. It's extremely important. Because was it actually on Passover? Passover occurs after the slaughtering of the lambs. So was it the Passover? Or was it this Passover celebration? You have to ask your question. Where did it take place in the upper room? Is this the same upper room of Acts chapter 2? And where was that upper room? So when we take a look at the last day, there was more prophecy fulfilled in one day than in any other day in the Bible. We begin to examine the sacrifice and the scapegoat. <clears throat> and how many of you realize that this statement of John that says, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world, harkens back to the Day of Atonement 
where you had two goats. And you remember, in order for the Day of Atonement to occur, the priest went behind the curtain, made an offering for his own sin so that his own sin was redeemed. And then he could come out and he was free of sin because atonement had been made for himself. And now he was able to receive the sin of Israel. And so as they brought the goats over, he had to do something very specific. He had to take his hands and he had to lay it on the heads of the goats to transfer the sin onto the goats, two goats. One goat was taken out to the desert of Azazel and there to be consumed by wild animals, and that bore the sin of Israel, the unintentional sin of Israel. How many of you sin unintentionally? We do it every day, by thought, by deed, by misdeed, by action, by inaction. All throughout our lives, we, this is why we're supposed to pray, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We do that daily because we sin daily. You know that old prayer, Lord, so far today I haven't hurt anybody, I haven't slandered anybody, I haven't killed anybody, I haven't lied, I haven't stolen anything, and I'm just about to get out of bed. <laughs> you know, that's the life we lead. So on this day, the priest would lay his hands, and the sin would be transferred onto the goats. And one goat was sacrificed, one goat was taken where it disappeared. Our sins, it was the only day of the year sins could be taken away. Now, under the Levitical system, which was in place under the law of Moses, which is in place until the death of Jesus, everything had to be done in accordance with the law. Therefore, when we see that example and we look at what happened to Jesus, how many of you believe that the Jews killed Jesus? How many of you have been taught that? Of course you've been taught that. As a matter of fact, it was just a ball game. And the cheering at the ball game last week against a Jewish school a Catholic team was playing a Jewish team, and they cried out, Jew killers. That was part of their uh, Christ killers. You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus was the chant. There's still that attitude today. Well, first of all, no one killed Jesus. God gave his only begotten son. The second thing is, <clears throat> we look at this Four days of examination. At the end of four days of examination, he was handed over. And what did they do to him? They beat him. Plucked out the hairs of his beard. They scourged him. They laid their hands on him, didn't they? Now understand the Levitical system. If only Rome had laid their hands on him and not Israel, he would have been only the sacrifice and the Messiah of Rome and the nations. If only Israel had laid their hands on him, he would have only been the Messiah and the sacrifice and the atonement for the sins of Israel. Both Israel and Rome had to lay their hands upon him for him to redeem the world. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. It had to be done in accordance with the Levitical law. This is why they laid their hands on him, because it harkens back to the day of atonement where you laid your hands. Now, once the hands were laid upon this man who had been declared without blemish or spot, not guilty, once the sin of the world was placed upon him, was he still not guilty? Was he still without blemish or spot? He was not. He was soiled by the sin of man. And this is the reason he was crucified outside the city walls, because the awful had to be taken outside the city. He was condemned in Jerusalem. He was crucified outside, and he exited not through the same gate he came in, but he exited through the sheep gate. The same gate the 256,000 lambs entered, and 256,000 lambs were returned to be slaughtered, and they were carried out through the sheep gate. So although there might have been a missed signal on Palm Sunday as the people cried out, Save us, O King. Behold, your King is coming for you, humble and riding on a colt, a donkey, the foal of a, a donkey. They waved palm fronds and leafy branches as if it were the Feast of Tabernacles. And they cried out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But he came at the time of the selection of the lambs. 
And he was revealing to Israel that he came as the suffering servant, as a suffering Messiah. And so I'll tell you, regardless of tradition, he had to die on the 14th day of the first month at the first slaughter of the lambs. So if Sunday was the first day, Monday was the second day, Tuesday was the third day, Wednesday was the fourth day, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on that afternoon. Why? Why did it have to be that way? Because Friday was a Sabbath, Thursday was a Sabbath. Guess what Wednesday was? Wednesday at sundown was a Sabbath. So when we take a look as to why he had to be crucified before sundown and be placed in the grave, why did darkness fall early at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon? Because it had to be that way in order to have him buried before sundown under Jewish tradition, because before the Sabbath. And so regardless of tradition, and I don't discount tradition, tradition makes it so that we celebrate Easter all throughout the world. We celebrate Good Friday all throughout the world on a uniform basis across the world. All Christians celebrate at the same time. It doesn't diminish its import, but when we look at the biblical timeline, the biblical calendar, and then we hear the words, it is finished, as his final words. And when we look at the words, it is finished, They're not random words. They're the very words that the priest says when he sacrificed the first Passover lamb. See, the high priest cuts the throat of the first lamb. And so how do you process 256,500 lambs? Well, you have 24,000 priests. It's the first one that defines the Passover lamb. And so when he sacrifices, when he cuts the juggler vein of the Passover lamb, he declares, it is finished. At the exact same time, Jesus breathed his last and said, it is finished. And you have to ask yourself, what is finished? Couldn't have been his life because three days and three nights later, he was raised up. And he walked the earth for another 40 days after that. So what was he declaring was finished? When we go back to Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Not until everything must happen, has happened. Not the least stroke of the pen will disappear from the law. And anyone who teaches others to break that law will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven or himself breaks it. And whoever teaches others to uphold that law and he himself does so is considered great in the kingdom of heaven. So here it is on the 14th day, the day of the slaughter of the lambs. The first lamb's throat is cut. It is finished. Jesus says it is finished. What is finished? The law of Moses has been fulfilled. This is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God provided the first sacrifice in the Garden of Eden. He now provided the final sacrifice. He began the sacrificial system in the Garden of Eden, and now he ended under the law of Moses the sacrificial system. It is done. And when we look at this, we see night fell early. Why did night fall early? Well, how many of you remember the story of uh, Abraham sacrificing Isaac? It's kind of an interesting story, and at the end of this teaching, I'll give you all the parallels. But one particular parallel I'll share with you is that they journey to the base of Mount Moriah and... Abraham looks at his servants and says to his two servants, you wait here. My son and I are going over there to worship. Yes? So the two servants didn't see what happened, did they? Night fell early. Darkness fell early at the 3 o'clock hour as opposed to the 6 o'clock hour. The 6 o'clock hour is considered to be twilight, and that's the time appointed by God for the slaughter of the lambs at twilight. But darkness fell early. And what happened to Jesus? There were two others on the cross, right? Either side of him who did not see what happened. Two witnesses that did not see what happened. Two witnesses that did not see what happened. What was on Jesus' head? Crown of thorns. What was on the ram's head? Caught in the thicket. A crown of thorns. They're the same story. When we understand the magnitude of 256,500 lambs, and we know exactly the lamb count, 
We know precisely the lamb count. We have a recorded history of the lamb count of that day. So much water, so much blood poured out on the altar that the priest had to take buckets of water to wash it out. Well, where did it go? It went out of the side of the temple and ran down to the Kidron Valley. You ever ask yourself why when the Roman soldier pierced Jesus, why it was water and blood that came out? Somebody's calling in with that question, that very question right now. I said, I was wondering... Why water and blood? What did Jesus say? Tear this temple down and I will rebuild it in three days. Right? You look at the temple, water and blood flowing out of its side. You look at Jesus, water and blood falling out of the side. You see exactly the reference. Because did exactly, you see parenthetically they say this is that he was referring to his body. It's always in parentheses. It means the original text did not say that. It's an inference. It's added to. That's why it's in parentheses. How many of you have ever been preached on the earthquake and that the graves opened up? Anybody ever tell you about the graves opening up? You read about it. Anybody ever preach about it? Not too many. Who was resurrected? The Jews or the Gentiles? The Jews. This was a Jewish resurrection. It's a fulfillment of what the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed in the resurrection. Why? Because Abraham believed in the resurrection. Because it was passed down that way. And so the graves open up and we don't see a whole lot of the reports because it's such an astounding thing. But the earthquake came. The curtain was rent in two from top to bottom. But the graves were open and the dead were raised. You don't hear much about it. But only the Jews were buried in Jerusalem. It's quite a story. It's quite an accounting, but not a lot of detail. But the resurrection of the dead is something that happens upon what? Jesus returns, who were, who were raised first? Those who were martyred, who were raised a thousand years later. The rest. And so we see that this is an event that actually has happened. It's not some future event. It's an actual event that's t- taken place. So the curtain was torn from top to bottom. Why? You remember that the Shekinah of glory of God did not enter the second temple the same way it did the first. It wasn't an ethereal event. It wasn't the glory cloud coming in. It was tied very specifically to Jesus' ministry. When Jesus first came and cleansed the temple, that was the first time the Shekinah glory came into the temple. And upon his death, the glory of God left. And so the curtain being rent in two takes us back to the time of Jacob's lament when Joseph is reported to him, they bring his bloody robe and they lay it in front of his father and and they tell him his son is dead. And what does he immediately do? He tears his garment from top to bottom. It's called the renting of the garment. It's a sign of mourning. And even in the description of Aaron's robe, the collar is reinforced so that you cannot tear it, so that no one could ever see the travail of the priest. You remember that Aaron lost two sons, but he could never show his lament for that. So a father losing a son, the response is, you tear the garment. A father losing a son, the response is, you tear the veil. Further demonstration that this was his only begotten son. The body was redeemed and buried. The body was... They came to take Jesus and put him where? In a borrowed tomb. He had no place to lay his head. He owned no property, no land, no place to lay his head in life. Therefore, he should not have a place 
But prophecy tells us, and the prophecies are very specific about this, about where he would be buried. We know that the chief priests and Pharisees remembered the three days. They scoffed at it. The response to him was almost, ha. It took us, what did they say, 64 years or 48 years or whatever the reference was. It wound up being a period over 60 years that the temple and the outbuildings were built. But they had a response of how long it took them to build that temple. And they scoffed at him. We see the earthquake. The tomb is opened. And an angel spoke on that resurrection day. And what did the angel say? He's not here. He's risen. So when we look at these prophecies, 28 specific prophecies fulfilled. The first one being the oldest prophecy in the Bible. The serpent would bruise the seed, bruise the seed of the woman. It was prophesied, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In John 12, 31 and 33, we read this. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. But he said this to signify by what death he was about to die. Who recruited Judas? Satan. Satan recruited Judas to sell out Jesus. 30 pieces of silver. Recruited by Satan to hand him over. The Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself, as prophesied by Daniel. Prophesied, and after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Daniel 9, 26 was fulfilled in John eleven fifty 50 to 52. Nor consider that it is better for us that one man die for the people than the whole nation should perish. Now, he did not say this of himself, but being high priest that year, prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also that he might gather together into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. A reminder, Caiaphas was high priest for that year. He was appointed. It was a political appointment. He was not in the lineage, in the Levitical lineage. Therefore, when we understand that during the second temple period, the high priest was appointed. The last high priest to serve in the temple was Zadok under Solomon's temple in the reign of David, and then Solomon. So the second temple's high priests were appointed. It began... With the Greeks, the Seleucids, Greek Syrian leaders, who defiled the second temple. You remember they defiled it, right, by sacrificing a pig. All right, the story of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, as the temple was cleansed and redeemed. And they were the ones to begin the appointment of the priest. We read during the millennial reign that it will be the sons of Zadok that are the reference point for the priesthood. Why? Because it's not related to Caiaphas. It has to go all the way back to the beginning of the lineage. We see that the portrayal of Jesus by Judas was foretold by David. Psalm 41, 9, he prophesied, even a man, my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Fulfilled in Mark 14, 10, 11, then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order that he might deliver him up to them. And after hearing this, they were delighted and promised to give him money, and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. You see, the prophecies of David, we look at David as king, but we also look at David as prophet. Many of the things that David foretold have come to pass. And he wasn't just talking about his own enemies. Certainly there was a time when he sat down with his enemies. Certainly there was a time who ate his bread that betrayed him. But it was also, as most prophecy is, for the people of the time. 
for what was and what is and what is to come. And so prophecy can be partially fulfilled at a time, but yet to be fulfilled. Jesus would be forsaken by his disciples as prophesied by Zechariah. Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my, ser- my shepherd, and against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. In Mark 14, 50, then they all forsook him and fled. Isn't that the case today, that God still deals with the shepherd, God still, still deals with the head, whether it's a congregational leader, whether or not it's a president, whether it's a head of a nation. God judges the head, and if you deal with the head, and you cut off the head, the people scatter. Look at these revolutions where the leader is deposed, he's kicked out or killed or exiled, and the Factions rise up. We see what's going on in Syria when you have three or four different factions. Nothing unified. We see what's happening in America today. We look at the situation in Brussels. In a nation country, the EU, that stopped acting like independent countries, opened up their borders and had this influx. And now they're being brought to their knees. have no idea this was coming, don't know what's going on with their own country, and people are up in arms about us wanting to close our borders. Had they not opened their borders, they wouldn't be in this predicament. And so who's the leader? You know, the, Brussels is the world capital of the EU and the headquarters of NATO. So they're the Washington, D.C. of Europe. It makes you think whether or not there's going to be an attack in our own Washington, D.C., as there was on 9-11. And yet we're totally inadequate, totally unprepared. And what will happen? The same thing. You strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. Look at the unrest in this country when JFK was shot, when Reagan was shot. Who else was shot? Gerald Ford. Wasn't he shot? Or did he just fall? He just fell down a <laughs> lot. I think maybe he just fell down a lot. <laughs> the price of his betrayal was also foretold by Zechariah. It was prophesied. And I said to them, if it is good, give me my price. And if not, let it go. So they weighed my price, 30 pieces of silver. You see, this was a prophecy fulfilled in Matthew 26, 15 and said, what are you willing to give me? And I will deliver him up to you. And they offered him 30 pieces of silver. Remember, there is no New Testament at the time of Jesus, so these things had to be prophesied in the Old Testament. That's where the prophecy comes from, prophesying a future event, and we look for that event, and we see how it correlates to this last week of Jesus' life. The time and the players and the amounts, and very specific, these are not accidental references. Zechariah, Zechariah also foretold what would be done with the betrayal money. In Zechariah eleven thirteen, he prophesied, and the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the princely price at which I was valued by them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. It was fulfilled in Matthew 27, 3 through 7. Now when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he was condemned, he changed his mind and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and have betrayed innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? You see to it yourself. And after throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he went out and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is the price of blood. And after taking counsel, they bought a potter's field with the pieces of silver for a burial ground for strangers. Have you seen these prophecies before? Have you examined these prophecies to see that this is the foretelling of Jesus and what would happen to him? And so if it was the Jews that killed Jesus, it must have been at the hand of God. If it was Rome that killed Jesus, it must have been at the hand of God. It must have been God's desire and design all along to provide a sacrifice for our sins to be atoned for, to be taken away. Since the fulfillment of the law did not take your sin away, the fulfillment of the law only covered your sin on an annual renewable basis. And so when we look at the Lamb's Book of Life and we come into this Passover and Easter season, we begin to realize that this inscription, the Lamb's Book of Life, 
heretofore before the time of Jesus, for 3,000 years before the time of Jesus, was an annually renewable entry into the Lamb's Book of Life. And as you use the period of time from the Feast of Trumpets, the first day of the seventh month until the tenth day of the seventh month, those ten days were for self-examination to take an account for what it was that you were to atone for on the tenth day of that month, the Day of Atonement. So that you could figure out during that period of time how you could repair the relationships you had broken, to repair the damage you had done. And don't you remember Jesus talked about this? He said, if you bring your gift to the altar and thereby realize your brother has something against you, leave your gift and go be reconciled to your brother. Then come back and your gift will be accepted. We're talking about this period of time. Remember, what you read about in the Gospels is a commentary, a dialogue, a discussion, a record of what took place under the Old Testament. Until you, everything that happened all the way up until the death of Jesus is Old Testament. The writings of it are what we call the New Testament. But the events described in the four Gospels are Old Testament events. Up until the statement, it is finished. Because now the law of Moses has been fulfilled with the final sacrifice. I know it's a different perspective than you might have, but think about it in that context. Think about when the New Testament's written. And what were the new events of the New Testament? When did the new events really begin? Book of Acts. So the four Gospels are a record of Old Testament events. Could have easily been added to, in a new manner, to the Old Testament. And start the New Testament with the book of Acts because that was the beginning of a new life. Now they're opening it up to the Gentiles because heretofore it could not be inclusive of the Gentiles. Gentiles couldn't come in to the temple, even at the time of Jesus. You remember Paul was put on trial, accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple. It was a grievous, it was a punishment by death if you did that. And so it was a new season, and still, all the way up until the destruction of the second temple, a Gentile could not enter the temple. They met together daily in the courtyard outside the temple. That's why it's so astounding when we look at the millennial reign, we see that there's Jewish and Gentile Levites. How can that be? Because God does a supernatural work. And so we see the priesthood is now made up of Jews and Gentiles. It's a whole new world in this whole new environment through the shed blood of Jesus. And so when we examine the Gospels, we see it's a record of an Old Testament account. It's an Old Testament for up until the time, he says, it is finished. Once it's finished, then he spends 40 days, yes, walking the earth, seen by over 500 eyewitnesses. And what does he say? He said, I'm going to leave here, but I'm going to send one. And ten days later, that prophecy was fulfilled, and the Holy Spirit was now available to everybody for the asking. How many of you actually know who was the first person, not if you studied with me before, but who was the first person to ever pray for the Holy Spirit to be available? Let me think about this one for a second. Run it over in your head. Who's the first person to pray that the Holy Spirit would be available to everybody? Jesus. Give me a guess. Jesus. Okay, there's a guess for Jesus. Anybody else? Moses. <laughs> Moses is the first one. Missed by a couple thousand years. Do you remember Moses standing there before God and he cries out to God. He said, look, this is too much for one man to handle. If you're going to make me lead these two million people, the 600,000 men, just take my life now. 
And God says to him, listen, gather together 70 of your elders and I'll take of my spirit, which is on you, and I will put it on them. And so God performed that and two of the leaders were not with him, Eldad and Medad. And so Joshua comes running to Moses and says, Moses, Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp and healing people. And he says to them, what are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all of Israel were prophets and the Spirit could be available to all of them. First person in the Bible to ever pray that the Spirit would be available to all. A prophecy, that prayer was answered at Pentecost. He was the first. You see, when you examine the Scriptures, you have to look at the entirety of the Scriptures and we look at it in the context of, oh, okay, he said that, but if his prayer was given up to God, did God answer that prayer? Moses prayed to enter the promised land, but God told him he couldn't, right? Well, except for that time when he's up on Mount Tabor, the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. I guess he made it. Mount Tabor's in Israel. So I guess he made it, didn't he? Not in the natural, but in the supernatural. And so when we examine Scripture, we have to look at the entirety of Scripture as being prophetic and fulfilled. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be sacrificed as the Passover lamb of God. Isaiah 53, 7, he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Now remember, Isaiah 53 is both prophetic in its description of Jesus. And whenever I hold up the matzah, this is what I quote from. It's pierced, it's bruised, it's wounded, it's striped, and it's without leaven, so it's without sin. And we take it and we break it just as his, he says at that Passover Seder. But it's also, when we look at it from the context of the prayer of repentance of Israel upon calling for the return of Jesus. God already gives them the prayer. And if you read it as a prayer and a confession as opposed to a prophecy, but it's also a prophecy, but if you read it in the tone of a confession, it reads a whole lot differently. It's quite amazing. It was fulfilled, 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, for Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us, from 1 Corinthians 5, 7, knowing that you were not redeemed by corruptible things, but by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who truly was foreknown before the foundation of the world was manifest in these last times for your sake. Isaiah also prophesied the scourging and the mocking that he would suffer. Isaiah 50 and 6, I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Matthew 27, 26 to 30. Then he released Barabbas to them, but after scourging Jesus, he delivered him up so that he might be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers, after taking Jesus with them into the praetorium, gathered the entire band against him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet cloak around him. And after plaiting a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a rod in his right hand and bowing on their knees before him, they mocked him and kept on saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then after spitting on him, they took the rod and struck him on the head. Prophesied by Isaiah and fulfilled. Both Isaiah and David prophesied that Jesus' body would be mutilated. Isaiah 52, 14, many were astonished at him, for his body was so disfigured, even his form beyond that of sons of men. And in Psalm twenty two seventeen, I can count all my bones, they look and gloat over me. His skin was torn from his flesh, so that his bones show through. Fulfilled in Matthew 27, 26, but after scourging Jesus, he delivered him up so that he might be crucified. In John 19, 11, then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. So many references, so many prophecies fulfilled in this last week and on this last day. The most significant event in Bible history. Of more prophecy fulfilled in one day than any other time in the history of creation. David prophesied the shame and dishonor that Jesus would suffer being condemned as a criminal. Psalm 69, 9 and 19 through 20. The reproaches of those who reproached you have fallen upon me. You have known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My enemies are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart and I'm full of heaviness and I look for sympathy, but there was none and for comforters, but I found none. In Matthew 26, at that point, Jesus said to the crowd, have you come out to take me with swords and clubs as against a robber? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. 
David also foretold the false witnesses would testify against Jesus. Psalm 35, 11, cruel witnesses rose up. They asked me of things that I knew nothing about. In Matthew 14, 55 to 57, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were trying to find testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they did not find any. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. And some rose up and bore false witnesses against him, saying, and they lied. And after examination by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the Herodians, Pilate, Caiaphas, Annas, all of them found, we find him not guilty. And they passed him back and forth like a pawn, hoping that one would take it in their own hands. Even Pilate said, I wash my hands of this, his blood is on your hands. For they had no reason to crucify him. I talked about on the radio on Friday night how as I examine what's going on with the RNC, the Republican National Committee, they are the Pharisees of today. Not because they're religious leaders, because they're power brokers. And they see one come along who is rocking their whole world, that's shaking their power. And they're fighting and railing and bucking against it because they want that power to remain in place. They don't want anybody to know their business. They want them to be beholding. They want people at their mercy. They want to take these junkets. They want to have these lobbyists paying for their vacations. And now you've got two men coming along that they're raising their hackles about. Trump and Cruz are saying, no, we're going to put an end to this. And they're the Pharisees of today because they'll plot and scheme to do whatever they can. And if they could, they would crucify. And they're the ones crying out, what? Crucify. We don't want either one of them. We'll bring in somebody. We'd rather have Hillary. That's what they're saying. We'd rather keep our power. We'd rather keep our status quo. We'd rather keep our big salaries and our big jobs and our special interests and remain as high and mighty senators and congressmen of this United States of America, then turn things around and give up the power. That was what the Pharisees were out against. That's why they plotted the death of Jesus, because he stood up to them and called them for what they were. And he spoke as one who had authority that knew what was going on. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would not make an effort to defend himself at the trial. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. In Matthew 27, 13, then Pilate said to him, Don't you hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer even one word to them, so that the governor was greatly amazed. So when you go back to Proverbs, you see this statement in Proverbs that says, Where there are many words, sin abounds. How many of you know somebody in your life that talks a lot? I remember when my daughter was growing up and I would say, Amanda, did you do this? And she would say, well, Dad, you don't understand the circumstances. It was, uh, the barometric pressure was 30.7 <laughs> inches and the wind was from the south by southeast at 8 miles per hour. The relative humidity was at 97%, and my friend's hair was having a problem. And the more details she gave me, the more I knew that her nose kept growing and growing and growing. Okay? It wasn't a simple answer. It was just so many words and so many details. There were so many extraneous details that had nothing to do with the story at all. I would just stop her and go, you're lying to me. Dad, how come you always know when I'm lying? Well, because there's so many details where there are many words and abounds. And so when you see these politicians who go on and on and on and on and on and they have complex stories, people on trial and have these elaborate stories, don't put me on a jury. Okay? The longer your answer is, the more I think you did it. Isaiah also foretold that Jesus' crucifixion as this was going to be the sin offering of the world. Isaiah 53, 4 and 6 and 10 and 11. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now, here this is a prayer. Here this is a confession. 
But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we ourselves are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all. Yet the Lord willed to crush him and has put him to grief. You shall make his life an offering for sin. And this is why when John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this was so profound because the sin offering under the law of Moses only covered your sins until the next time you sinned, and then you would have to make another sacrifice. For the blood only covered the sin. Now the shed blood would take away the sin. This is a profound thought. But yet Isaiah, through the prophecy of God, this isn't Isaiah speaking, this is God speaking through Isaiah. You shall make his life an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and that the purpose of the Lord might prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul. He shall be fully satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, and he shall bear their iniquities. All fulfilled in the death of Jesus. Isaiah also foretold that the crucifixion is the sin offering for the world. John nineteen sixteen through 19. You see, not just as the sin offering for Israel, not just as the Jewish Messiah, But it extended the same way God's plan from the beginning in the Exodus. There was a mixed multitude. It wasn't just all Jews leaving Egypt. There were Egyptians there, sojourners. And the law of Moses wasn't just specifically for the Jews. There were references within the law that applied to the sojourner, the stranger among them, referring to Gentiles that pitched their tent with the camp of Israel. Some of it applied, some of it did not. When we take a look at Abraham, Abraham was not Jewish. Sarah was not Jewish. Two Gentiles made a Jew. And so if the origin was without identity of the Jewish line, take a look at what happened when Ruth merged with Boaz, when the broken nation of Moab, Ruth the Moabitess, merges with Boaz, Look at the promise of the lineage. Look at the power of the lineage to Jesse, to David, to Jesus. It was always God's plan from out of the two to make one. But we first see that in Ephesians 2 when he defines it that way, the one new man. But he was the sin offering for the world. Therefore, he then delivered him up to them so that he might be crucified. Now they took Jesus and led him away and went out bearing his own cross to the place called a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. And with him two others, one on the side and one on the other side, and Jesus in the middle. Now Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross, and it was written, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. But he was the sin offering for the world and not just the King of the Jews. I've shared with you before that I was 44 years old before I learned that Jesus was Jewish. You say, well, didn't you ever hear King of the Jews? I said, yeah, as an insult. They weren't honoring him as King of the Jews. It was an insult. If you're the King of the Jews, save yourself. It was a mockery. I wasn't placed up there to honor him. And so I grew up believing that Jesus was the God of the Gentiles. We had God and you had Jesus. And if you ask most of the Jewish people, they'll tell you, Jesus is the God of the Gentiles. A lady called me on the radio yelling at me on Friday night. What kind of rabbi are you? You know, Christianity is, uh, uh, Jewish, Jews are monotheistic and Christians are polytheistic. And I said, what? Yeah, they have many gods. I said, really? That's so surprising to me. I'm shocked. Yeah, uh, Jews and and Muslims are are much more alike than Jews and Christians because Jews and Muslims only have one God, but Christians have more gods. I was like, you're probably the most ill-informed person I've ever spoken to. She called me a disgrace on the air. said, you're a disgrace. What kind of rabbi are you who talk about Muslims? We should be welcoming them into our homes. I go, welcome into your home. 
Right. Good luck with that. As Isaiah had prophecy, he was numbered among lawmakers. He was counted among the transgressors, Isaiah 53 and 12. And Luke 23, 32 and 33, and also two other malefactors were led away with him to be put to death. And when they came to the place called Skull, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right and one on the left. David prophesied that his hands and feet would be pierced. Psalm twenty two sixteen. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encircled me. They pierced my hands and my feet. In Mark fifteen twenty five, and they crucified him. And then in John twenty twenty five to twenty seven, then the other disciples said to him, "We have seen the Lord." But he said to them, "If I did not, if I do not see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it at all." Now after eight days, the disciples were within and Thomas with them. After the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Bring forth your finger and see my hands and bring forth your hand and put it into my side and be not unbelieving but believing. Prophecy fulfilled in the last week. These prophecies that we seem to not look and recognize as prophecies by the psalmist And then confirmed in Zechariah that they would look upon the one they have pierced. God's preparing us to look for the one that we might recognize him by a certain sign. We not be confused by the false messiahs that come into the world. They call themselves messiah. There are hundreds of them. There's books written on the 70-something false messiahs that have come along before and after Jesus. Erdogan in Turkey, his people call him God. False messiahs all over the place. Look at these leaders of these megachurches that raise themselves up and hold themselves out and then all of a sudden get into sexual sin. Happens all the time. They're falling, believing in their own press, believing in their own publicity. Believing that, look at this Rob Bell. How many of you knew about Rob Bell? Years ago, Rob Bell was a genius, a biblical genius. Created the most amazing video series called Numa that I had ever seen. It correlated the Old Testament with the New Testament. It was powerful, and then all of a sudden he started to get off. Now he preaches there is no hell, and that God created gays and lesbians, and he's gone off the deep hell, a deep end. And he was a mega pastor. He's thrown in with Oprah. That should tell you everything you need to know. And so there's many that come along thinking they have a message from God, a divine message, divine revelation from God that only they can understand, and they're appointed to deliver that message to deliver the people. If you watch TBN, you see them all the time. They're there. All right, when we come back together next week, we're going to be in part four. We'll finish up the prophecies and get into a little bit more material. But we've hit our time. Any questions? Comments? The lady that called, was she Jewish? She was Jewish. Yes, the lady who called was Jewish. So what kind of rabbi was I? I was a disgrace. How could I call myself rabbi? I said, I don't know. I went to school. They gave me this thing. <laughs> <laughs> give it to you for life. They say, here, you're a rabbi. I say, okay. You know, that's how you do it. That's how we all do it. You can do it the same way. You know, I'm sure that uh, the captain of the Titanic got a certificate calling him captain. <laughs> Went to school for it. Captain was he? Right, right, right. Exactly. What kind of captain was he? It was a disgrace. All right, I hope I see you on Friday night at 7 o'clock at Mountaintop. All of you are welcome. It'll be a great communion service, and uh, it will reveal a lot to you. And if not, I'll give you the answer next week as to the answer to the question as to how you can take communion. I'll make it a defensible position for you. All right, well, stand to your feet. Let me send you out with blessing. Don't forget, pick up a book, DVD, sign up for Israel. Put something in the green bag. If you don't know what the green bag is, you need to familiar yourself Familiarize yourself with the green bag. Put something in there, help support the ministry. 
In Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you're to bless the children of Israel. He goes on to say, In this way I will put my name on them and I will bless them. Please bow your heads to receive the Aaronic benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen and amen. You are dismissed. Shalom. Behind the scenes of the Middle East conflict rages a biblical battle as old as time. Two seemingly innocent teenagers cross paths and a mystery begins to unfold. Jake Aronson, Jewish son of a U.S. diplomat, has unusual ties to the intelligence community and has savant gifting in solving puzzles, codes, and ciphers. Jake meets Hakeem Baba, a Tehran-born radical Muslim bent on the destruction of the Jewish people and whose father is a Turkish diplomat to the United States. The two of them forge a friendship while in boarding school. But during his visits with the Aronson family, Hakeem learns of DNA testing to determine Jewish lineage. He also learns of a secret the family has kept for over 3,000 years. Now, Hakeem's plans have been discovered. Jake and his team deploy to stop him. Their final encounter brings about a chilling transformation and opens the door to the next installment of The Aaron Chronicles, revealing the mystery behind Aaron's robe. The Codist, The Aaron Chronicles by Eric E. Walker from Tate Publishing. Signed copies available at thecodistbook.com.